Great. Um, thank you, Rowan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tim Briglin, the chair of the House Energy and Technology Committee. It is Friday afternoon at one o'clock uh, on March 25th. And um, we have kind of an oddly named uh, hearing this afternoon, um, which on our agenda says orphaned neighborhoods and non-CUD towns. And one of the things that um, I wanna have a discussion in committee on this afternoon, um, and in particular, there's a couple of members of our committee, but also a number of members of the legislature who have talked formally and informally with members of this committee about um, towns that they represent that are, uh, you know, by Vermont standards, um, fairly well connected um, looking across the town, but have pockets that are really not well served at all and maybe even um, altogether unserved. And, um, you know, challenges of trying to get those pockets, those neighborhoods, um, connected, um, you know, quite possibly those towns uh, either are not CUD towns or are unlikely to become CUD towns. Um, many of those towns are either in or around Chittenden County. And, um, you know, again, I, as, as I think I've said to some of the witnesses today, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't want to just leave it to kind of brainstorming, but, um, you know, the, the uh, folks that we've invited in to speak with the committee today, I know have been thinking about this issue and um, we would like to kind of compare notes about, um, you know, how we can possibly help out towns that do have these neighborhoods that are, um, are really lacking uh, decent connectivity. Um, so on our agenda today, um, we've got Rob Fish with us, who's the director of the um, BCBB. Um, Clay Purvis, who's the director of telecom at the Department of Public Service. Um, Meredith Dolan, who um, is working in a consulting role with the town of Colchester. And again, I think Colchester is a, is a good example of a town that you know, generally is, is pretty reasonably covered, but does have some pockets that, that, lacked, uh, that lacked decent connectivity. Um, Sean Keough, who's the chair of the Northwest CUD, and um, I, you know, I know there's some discussions going on in northern um, Chittenden County as to how um, they are or may work with the, the Northwest CUD. And then here in our committee room, um, we have Maria Royal, who's our um, legislative counsel on broadband issues. So, um, Rob, I'd first like to turn to you just to kind of start the conversation um, and appreciate you. Uh, being with us today. Thanks for making time. Sure. Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, just to clarify, I'm the, the Deputy Director of the Vermont Community Broadband Board. I uh, Christine beg your pardon. <laughs> I, I beg Christine's uh, <laughs> um, forgiveness as well on that. But thanks for being here, Rob. <laughs> no problem. Uh, yeah, for the record, uh, I'm Rob Fish. I'm the Deputy Director of the Vermont Community Broadband Board. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today. And the focus of my presentation is on a lot of table setting of going over where these areas are and the various challenges. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen right now, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> I believe you all should be seeing something at this point. Yep, we can. Perfect. Uh, so first, I'm going to start. I'm going to start statewide and talk about the number of eligible addresses, uh, addresses that are eligible for our construction programs. So, so, oh, actually, there's a big typo there. No wireline connections of at least 25.3 are what defines eligible addresses. Uh, there's 64,000 or so total addresses eligible for the program. 5,598 of these addresses are non-CUD towns. This is 8.7% of the addresses. Uh, we have an expectation to, over time, provide the CUDs with up to 60% of their funding via grants, and the CUDs will revenue bond or find money elsewhere for the rest. Uh, the expected construction funding, what we're looking at right now, it's still not enough, but we have $116 million in the construction program at this point. We are expecting, and thank you to the House for passing today, a budget that has $95 million in additional ARPA funds. And then we are expecting at least $100 million from the, the federal infrastructure bill. So, so what this comes out to for non-CUD towns is about 26 and some odd million dollars in grants we would expect about 17.7 .7 million to come from elsewhere. So we're talking about 44 million. Uh, so this is all CUD towns, not just what we're gonna talk about is orphan towns. 
Uh, we should also note that the, the CUDs are receiving additional pre-construction support. So this is for capacity, this is for study, this is for research and, and planning. So zooming in a little bit of identifying areas that are not members uh, of the CD. Uh, yeah, okay. Can, can you hold on, Rob? We've got a question here. Rob, that last line there, the uh, 44.27 million total, uh, what is that referring to? Is that grants that you've already given out Oops. or what? It's referring, we've established an allocation uh, based on underserved road miles. So these are road miles that don't currently have access to at least 25.3 and have addresses. Uh, based on that allocation, eight and a half percent, of all the funding goes to the non-CUD towns. So we have the grant money from that that has not, that's been, it's what's available. Um, and then what we're figuring on is that an additional 17.7 .7 million will come from elsewhere in order to solve the problem. Uh, this is all based on the current available funding. So that's where the total comes from. Okay, thank you. So, so zooming out a little bit again of looking at areas not in CUDs. Uh, I'll start in the south. We have an area in southern Windsor. It's a Weathersfield, Cavendish, uh, Baltimore. It's an area that's not a CUD. It's bordered by VTEL on the south, EC Fiber on the north. It's primarily uh, TDS. So this is uh, like Perkinsville Telephone. Uh, TDS is planning on a fiber build. Uh, in other parts of those towns, EC fiber may come in from the north to do fiber. Uh, over looking, going a little further west, so the southern part of uh, Rutland County, there's a few towns that are not members of the CUD. Uh, they were well, well served by cable, uh, they're very well served by VTEL in most areas, but do have some areas that are in consolidated wire service where there are some underserved addresses. Uh, the CUD is looking to potentially have those towns become a part of their effort and working with Southern Vermont to potentially work with Consolidated to find a solution for all those areas. Then we have the Waitsfield, Waitsfield Telecom towns. They are actively building out fiber and we're expecting a funding request from them. Then we're in Chittenden County. Uh, these are areas that are... So the, these are areas that are not a member of the CUD, and there's no current plan by a provider to provide service to expand. Uh, there's things happening here and there. MC Fiber is building out some areas. Uh, Burlington Telecom is building out some areas. Uh, but in general, there's extensive cable service. Uh, in some areas in the southern part, the telephone service is split between two different providers. Uh, most cases, I guess in all cases, uh, Waitsfield and Consolidated. There's a lot of suburban development, so this leads to an increased amount of underground. There's pockets of underserved served by cable. Uh, the, the telephone service is primarily provided by Consolidated, which uh, so with Act 71 is not an eligible provider. Uh, they can only work in partnership with, with CUDs. And these towns didn't apply or receive anything from the Broadband Innovation Grant Program, which did feasibility studies and business planning. They also were not eligible for the pre-construction program. So they're, they're not benefiting from an uh, initial level of, of planning and discussion to, to move things forward. So a, it's not the, the coordination isn't necessarily there as it is elsewhere in the state. So- uh, Rob, do you take a question? Uh, go ahead, yeah, well, it's actually just a clarification uh, on the uh, the your previous talking points. Your last bullet, uh, these towns, uh, and that was a choice that these towns yes. made not to become CUDs, not to work together with their neighbors, uh, and so they made a choice to not do that and then not be eligible for those grants, or the feasibility study, or the pre-construction grant. Yeah, that, that is correct. Uh, they could have applied to the Broadband Innovation Grant uh, Program. Um, I don't believe any even ap applied. Um, if they did, they, they did not go through the process for these towns. But I guess my point is they would have been eligible. Yeah. There's nothing about these towns that would have made them ineligible if they had been working with their neighbors, which is- Correct. Okay. That is 100% right. okay. correct. And, and um, I, I need um, help catching up on that thought. Could, Rob, could you go back to, the, to your first slide, the by the numbers non-CUD slide? Oh, sure. <clears throat> and I, I, what I was a little bit confused on, on this slide is 
Does any of the money here referenced on this slide apply to some of these orphaned neighborhoods or towns that we're talking about, or does it not? Has the train no. already the station? No, that's, these towns are certainly eligible for funding. Uh, that's what I attempted to break it down here. A statewide, 8.5% uh, of the funding that we're dedicating to construction right now is going to these towns. Uh, so they are eligible for funding. That's 26.56 million in grants. Um, and if you count what we hope that will leverage for, especially for infrastructure that's not publicly owned, uh, we're expecting it to be at least 44 million. So they do have access to funding. It may just be a challenge for deploying the funding because of the, the unique circumstances. Uh, it's not an insurmountable cha challenge as I'll go through a few examples, but it okay. is a challenge. Great, just wanted to be clear on that. Um, Mike and then Laura. Yeah. Uh Speaking to Laura's point about the uh, towns that did not choose to uh, apply for those things, and I just wanted to point out that there are some towns that aren't bordered by a, an existing CUD. Um, for instance, Shelburne, which is north of uh, Charlotte. Charlotte is being served by Whitesfield Champlain Valley Telecom. So is Hinesburg, and so is, uh, let's see, on, uh, not Underhill, I Huntington. Huntington, yeah, there you go. And uh, those towns kind of cut Shelburne off from the southern CU, the, the, the uh, Maple Broadband. And so they, they can't really become part of that CUD because they're, they're kind of an island. They certainly could form their own CUD. They could form their own CUD, but then they'd have to get they'd have to form, a, uh, I guess there could be a one town CUD. No, you can't. The, the, the CUDs, the, the, it doesn't have to be contiguous either. They could Correct. technically join a CUD, but it's there's there's certainly logistical concerns with that. And uh, I'll, be, I'll, be using, I'll be using Charlotte as, a, as an example later in the presentation for some of these issues. So, okay. Uh, so uh, just- uh, uh, Rob, uh, I'm sorry, one second. I'm sorry, I can't see hands, I apologize. No, it's okay, Go ahead. This, this question is for you, yep. and this is more, um, we have our ledge council in here, and as we're talking about this, I mean, I would love it if we would ask her if we say something that is off, or that she knows is incorrect <laughs> on the legislation, if we would ask her to just kind of chime in, or do you want to ask, sure. have that happen more formally afterwards? Uh, it certainly doesn't have to be formal. Okay. So if you, want to, the rock. if you want to wave a flag or take the chair or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'd absolutely welcome that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Rob, why don't, you, why don't you continue? Sure, sure. So it's a, they're a difficult business case as there's a the mix of served and unserved. We mentioned that there's pockets, there's underground. Uh, there's also a lack of public oversight and coordination. These towns did not join a CUD. Uh, they may have at the town level done some coordination and uh, the Regional Planning Commission is doing some coordination on this issue. They're, they're holding workshops that I know uh, MC5 are presented to towns, uh, Northwest CUD will present and potentially others. Uh, so I kind of further defined it down into the, the towns of Colchester, Westford, Jericho, Underhill, Williston, goes on and on, but it's, uh, it's a total of 975 addresses. So it's 1.52% of all underserved addresses in the entire state. Uh, it also should be noted that since these towns are well served by cable now, there's likely a business case for a fiber provider to come in over the next year not the next few years. Uh, we know that, cons that Consolidated is building out fiber across the state, primarily in cabled areas. Uh, they have no plans for this year for that area, but they do expect to eventually do some work up in Chittenden County. So there may not happen immediately, but there, there is a longer term vision of these areas, uh, at least the areas that are currently cabled that doesn't account for the, the pockets uh, to be converted to fiber. Um, I also, I did include South Burlington and Essex Junction on here, but there are active Burlington Telecom fiber builds underway. So I wanted to just uh, dig in more by the numbers in terms of the number of addresses. I'm not gonna say everything on the slide here, but in terms of the amount of money that is currently quote unquote with the, with the assumptions of what's gonna happen in the budget and the infrastructure bill um, available for these towns. 
but I want to go into the, the challenges. So coordination is a big challenge. They didn't join. They didn't join a CUD uh, previously. It, admittedly, didn't make as much sense to join a CUD because there there wasn't the even with aggregating all these addresses, it would be hard for them to create a new provider to serve these areas. But there's a whole other part of this, which is the oversight and planning that could be used to develop coordination, to, to coordinate and develop plans with providers. Uh, the scattered addresses, additional planning. There's also a lot of existing infrastructure. So the underground gaps in infrastructure and exclusive conduit. I'll get to all of these in more detail in a second. So here we are. <laughs> so universal service ch plan challenge. So to access the Act 71 plan, the Act 71 construction funds, there needs to be a plan for the entire town to serve every address. This is challenging when there's not a there's not a single entity coordinating it. Uh, the way it works right now is so the green on here is is Waitsfield, and then there's a tiny area up top here that is. That is consolidated. I hope I'm not reversing this right now. But uh, so the, the two companies would have to negotiate to be able to serve and present an application to serve the entire town. Uh, this can get awkward. Uh, it's not impossible, but it can certainly get awkward. And it creates a situation where one provider could technically block another from getting access to funding. We have very little discretion in Act 71 around that. So that's one example, but it has worked. Uh, we've talked a lot about Bolton uh, during the first few months of the, of the, uh, of the VCBB. Uh, you, once again, you have Waitsfield, the green, that serves everything but a handful of addresses that uh, topography, geography, the roads, make it where that is part of the consolidated wire center. Uh, in this case, it's part of an RDOF block uh, and consolidated has committed to building out fiber there. So there is a universal service plan and we're expecting any day now a full application uh, to build out the remainder of the addresses with 100 by 100 service in Bolton. Going further south, it gets even crazier as you see all these colors on the map. Uh, for This is for Weathersfield and Cavendish. So TDS has a plan to build out their wire center uh, with fiber. Uh, it's what they're, what they're telling us right now. Uh, EC fiber may be serving the areas in red that's what they're exploring. And yet there still is a stray address, which may be a mistake. I have to contact VTEL down here in the blue, this tiny portion that they serve that's underserved. So we have the, everybody on the same page. It can be a challenge. Uh, we talked about scattered addresses. So these are the eligible addresses across Colchester. You see that there are various pockets of addresses. There are addresses that, that could be served from the Milton side. Uh, it could be served based off of substation, I'll get there in a second. But there's also addresses that are the exact opposite part of the town. It does make it difficult for one plan or one provider to solve it all. And there's nothing in place to coordinate between those providers to develop a universal service plan. Uh, Rob, uh, Rob sure. just, and maybe we'll hear more about this, but uh, uh, how many providers in Colchester? How many providers currently offering fiber in Colchester? Zero. How many phone companies? Uh, there is just one. It is entirely consolidated. Is there? There's no Comcast there. Oh, there is Comcast. I'm I'm only talking about providers of, of fiber at this point. There is Comcast, uh, and it's Comcast has the majority of the town built out with fiber, except really everything except for the addresses that you see here that are the dots are served by cable at this point, but they're scattered. Everything These are that we. Right. So this is, so I mean, this map is ridiculous. Uh, the the provider has left these addresses like this. I mean, it's a real testament to the problem that we saw, uh, and and you know, distressing that you see it even in these heavily populated areas. To leave these, you know, and it, anyway. Continuing, sorry. And, and it happens elsewhere too. Like even across the border in Burlington, you see there's a few scattered addresses, but it, it makes it it makes it challenging. Uh, so it's there's a conflict between the goal of wanting to get everybody up to 100 by 100 and wanting to get service immediate. Uh, we'll get into some of the other things in, in a moment, but but I guess, for the I guess my point was it's a little bit hard to believe um, that these are too expensive to build to when you're in this densely populated area. No. 
anyway. Yeah, it's 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 a difference between a new build that would bring fiber versus Comcast deciding to extend their lines into into these areas. Um, there, there's other challenges of, as well, of course, um, and it's really just a matter of the business case. So, well, like, that, uh, well Rob, actually, sorry, not to not to <laughs> belabor the point, but that was my point about the business case. Uh, you know, this is what I would have expected to have heard from the providers prior to this, that, you know, we would see these unserved addresses because the, there was no business case for it. But when you're in these large, you know, our largest cities, states, our uh, towns in the state, it's pretty hard to buy that the business case does not work in these one-off locations in these neighborhoods. So be that as it may. All right, settle down, Sibelia. <laughs> Here we are. So okay. we appreciate your passion around this topic, Representative Sibelia. <laughs> no, it's, I, I, it's I mean, true. I, no, it's, it's a, yeah, what, I want to echo oh, it. It is frustrating, yeah. but I mean, the, we, yeah. we know where we are. So yes. we're trying to find the path forward. <laughs> so just as, a, as one looking deeper into Colchester again, uh, examples. So there's, there's fiber at the substations. So that's the, the red dots here that are somewhat near addresses. Uh, but there's a lot of expenses with hopping around in terms of equipment. Uh, we also have Milton up here, which is a member of a CUD that is gonna be built out over time. Uh, Sean will speak to, the, to that later. And there's these handful of addresses here. But the way it's structured now, any provider is gonna have to serve the other part of the town. There's no entity that's doing, the, that, that's doing that coordination. It would have to be provider pr to provider, potentially maybe it could be the RPC, uh, it could be an option. And there's also an outstanding question of whether a town could contract for service in order to, to make up the difference in gap. We did some very back of the napkin, high level analysis of the, the model that's underway in uh, up in Northwest now and how that would apply to Colchester with the mix, with the geography and the mix of underserved. And it was gonna cost $13 million uh, at the, with plus or minus a million at least uh, to serve the entire town based on the underground, based on just the structure of the town and the need to, to get everywhere. Uh, that the amount of grant funding that's available dwarfs that. The amount of funding that would be available from the provider Northwest is working with also dwarfs that. Is there a way for the town to be able to participate in funding these situations uh, by contracting for service with the CUD. That's something we're unclear about in legislation because it says a town can contract with a private provider. But when that was written, I don't think anyone was thinking that a CUD would be in a position, the best position to offer that service. So that's getting a little bit off topic there, but that's one outstanding question. So challenge of underground. So this is everything from new residential developments there's like a homeowners association where it's underground. Uh, it could be uh, manufactured housing parks, uh, condos, like anywhere where a lot of the stuff has become, has moved underground and the cost is quite a bit more expensive. Uh, there's also an issue in some of these developments, uh, especially if they're built by a single developer, where there's often various deals where conduit is put in, but only a certain company has exclusive rights to that conduit making it really expensive logistically and economically to get access to all those customers, which is discouraging for a provider like Burlington Telecom, for instance, for going into different areas. Uh, if there's also affordability issues here and, and choice issues here. So that's another thing I wanted to point out. Uh, there's also at times gaps in infrastructure. And I just used an example here of, so we have the blue here is, is a GMP uh, electric territory. And we have the red or the pink here is, Burl is uh, in Burlington electric territory. Uh, this is route 127 through here. There's a gap between the two. There's no conduit, which if there were, it could allow fiber to get into all of those denser neighborhoods in Colchester. Given that many of those neighborhoods are underground, uh, it's more, this is more just showing an example of other issues around the state that, that could be looked at. So I'm going to I'm going to leave it there because I more just wanted to set the table and give time to the other speakers to go into even more detail and uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Rob. Um, Representative Yantashka. Yeah, uh, because I'm most familiar with the show situation, uh, I'm going to ask the question about this, but 
In your slide show in Charlotte, I think that's number eight in your deck. Um, uh, that one little section uh, up there that's served by consolidated, does that, uh, be, by virtue of the uh, law that we passed, uh, does that eliminate Waitsfield Champlain Valley Telecom from getting the broadband money to serve the rest of Charlotte? So the way the way the law is structured right now is you need a plan for the entire town. So right. they would need some level of commitment from consolidated to serve those addresses. In most cases, uh, an incumbent telephone company is not going to build outside of their service area. Right. So, so to answer, answer your question, is, yes. Yeah. They would need that, something that from consolidated happen. or they would need to find they would need to go beyond their their current borders, which is possible. Uh, or they would need to find a, a third provider to to serve those addresses. Okay, so that concerns me even more. Thank you. Any other questions for Rob for the moment? Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Um, Clay, just wanted to turn to you now. Um, you know, if you have any thoughts on this topic or things to share with us. Great. Uh, well, thank you for having me, uh, Chair Brigland. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, that was a, a great presentation by Rob. Uh, so I'm going to keep my comments very brief here. Um, <clears throat> we have at the Department of Public Service, um, uh, kind of through the CRF period, as the VCBB was getting established, as you're writing the legislation, you know, many of these communities, um, the department staff dealt with um, uh, on a on a uh, individual basis uh, to to expand broadband. So, um, I just want to talk a little bit about um, you know the, the the program that I think um, provided some relief for these towns, which is Leak the, the line extension consumer assistance program. Uh, this is a program that you all um, <clears throat> uh, passed uh, in the, uh, the beginning of the pandemic, uh, provided line extensions for um, people who wanted them. Uh, unlike our other broadband programs, this is really, um, I would say surgical in its, in its approach. It relied on individuals applying to the program. It's really a benefit to um, uh, to, to individual consumers uh, to provide them with the funding they needed for small scale line extensions. So um, I think Rob gave a very helpful presentation on on Colchester. Colchester is an example of where um, we were able to uh, assist 35 homes. Uh, uh, in the the eastern part of the of the town, um, it was not a cheap build. Um, Thirty five homes. It was well over uh, three hundred thousand um, dollars. It was uh, a cost that was almost equally borne by the carrier, the state, and the the community. Um, so you know, uh, wh while these towns in Chittenden County. Uh, and you know, also in in central South Central Vermont, um, you know, may be well served uh, in most of their town. The cost of getting to these um, these areas is still significant. And uh, as I think uh, the previous presentation points out, that the funding isn't always enough um, by itself to. Um, uh, to, to provide a, a comprehensive solution. So, you know, when we were looking at these towns, um, being able to um, take care of these areas and steps, really get in and address the issue that is preventing broadband from getting deployed um, and really looking at it on a case-by-case -case basis, I think is gonna be very important to uh, finding a solution um, that neighborhood around Mallets Bay um, certainly could be a factor of multiple different uh, uh, multiple different factors contributing to that problem. 
Um, it could be a conduit issue. It could be the fact that many of them might be seasonal addresses and generally people who live in seasonal addresses don't wanna pay for the service year round, making the business case um, difficult or maybe it's not necessary for those addresses. So there are lots of issues um, that um, uh, contribute uh, to an individual neighborhood not being um, being served, and that's certainly somewhere where the, the VCBV and its planning, especially with the infrastructure money, uh, may want to think about um, kind of addressing those issues on, on a surgical basis. Like something you mentioned that um, I just want to be clear on. I mean, I, I know that the line extension program um, has elapsed at this point, and you know the money that was uh, that was put forth there has been expended, and whatever didn't get expended, um, we're, we're obviously beyond that time frame now. But that, uh, can you remind me, was that all um, public money, uh, or to what extent was that supplemented by? Um, money that came from either uh, the individual homeowners who were supported with that um, line extension program and or the private carriers who may have also contributed money? Or was that all money under the, the, um, the line extension program, the public money? That's a, that's a good question. It, it really depends on, uh, on the case. In most cases, the the build was um, uh, borne by both the carrier and the um, the state. So we provided a credit up to three thousand um, dollars. We used uh, the line extension rule from from in most instances the cable line extension rule was applied here. So uh, the cable companies, to the extent they were expanding uh, their service. Um, uh, adhered to the cable line extension formula, which d divides the cost between uh, the cable company and uh, the consumers. And we were paying simply the consumer portion of that cost. There were some instances where the consumer portion of the cost exceeded the uh, state benefit. And in some cases, and Colchester is a good example of that, uh, there was a uh, consumer contribution above and beyond um, the uh, uh, resources that the carrier and the state provided. Yeah. I, the reason I ask, um, and again, I'm, I, I'm obviously in this, this question will indicate how rusty I am on this stuff, but at the time, something that I, that I found, well, that I was taken aback by was um, some of the costs that were put out for, you know, some of these line extension projects. And I, I think my frame of reference was, um, you know, somewhere in the realm of conversations that we've had with CUDs in the last uh, three or four years about what it costs them per mile to, you know, to roll out, um, you know, an extension of their existing network. And again, that might be the absolute wrong frame of reference, but um, I, I was taken aback by some of the dollar amounts that were thrown around by the incumbent carriers to extend lines for, you know, whatever it was, a mile or two, um, which seemed way out of line with some of the, um, you know, some of the network building um, uh, figures that we were kind of throwing around as we were talking about fiber builds. And again, maybe they are not comparable, but that, I couldn't help use that frame of reference. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, um... Uh, that's a good point. I mean, I think the frame of reference we've been using is about forty thousand dollars a mile. Um, there have been instances, though, where uh, a make ready situation or the um, the need for uh, building back into the network beyond the neighborhood. So it's not simply a a matter of um, starting from the end of the line and going to the last house on the street, but actually having to build back into the network. And, and there, you know, there is a question uh, as to um, how the um, line extension rule should be applied in those circumstances. Uh, but given the fact that this was a grant program, um, you know, we, um, uh, we really tried to push forward with these line extensions in good faith. And for the vast majority of them, 
you know, the, the state benefit covered the line extension. Um, I have to go back and look at the numbers, but I believe our average um, consumer payout was about $2,300 um, a, a person. So um, we, um, um, we were able in, in most instances to cover the, the full cost uh, the consumer portion of the cost of the line extension. Uh, there were some very expensive builds um, that went well beyond. Um, you had low customer counts, which the way the line extension rule works does place a greater burden on the consumer uh, for the cost. They're going to they're going to assume a greater share of the cost when um, when the density is lower. Um, and the mileage, you know, some of these builds, you know, you're still talking about two or three miles of, of, of builds to get to the neighborhood. Um, I can't think of an instance where we thought a carrier was misrepresenting the cost. Um, again, Colchester, uh, you know, was an example where actually the, the carrier assumed a greater amount of the cost than they were required to um, under, uh, under the line extension formula. So, um, you, you know, I, I don't think uh, that <clears throat> uh, carriers uh, were necessarily, um, uh, I think they were all uh, happy and, and willing to participate in the program, but um, I don't think it was without some pain for them as well. Um, yeah. Some some carriers um, saw it as a good opportunity. We had good projects both in Bolton and uh, Franklin as well. Um, and Bolton was an example where, um, again, with with um, with some oversight and coordination from um, uh, a respected member of the community in the town. Um, was able to marshal together a good project that, um, again, served, I believe, 35 addresses. It was, it was another uh, really strong project. Um, you know, but that said, um, you know, these, these were administratively intense uh, projects to manage. Um, they were small scale uh, so they, they weren't uh, whole town solutions, uh, the kind of solutions that Act 71 is contemplating where there's a, there's a universal plan. These were um, projects that were largely community driven uh, and were designed to um, surgically address um, an acute sh uh, connectivity shortage in a neighborhood. Well, I mean, that's helpful context, and I appreciate you sharing that. I mean, I, I, it's of no surprise to you that maybe some of the more expensive um, uh, proposals, you know, somehow made their way to my doorstep, and that probably discounts the other 40 that I didn't see. Um, but so I, I, it's, it's helpful as a reminder that, you know, some of the um, projects that were quite successful. Uh, so um, I appreciate that. Um, I want to turn to Meredith now. Um, Meredith, thanks for being here. Um, my understanding, and, and there's a two-page document that you posted, or that we posted on your behalf to our website. Um, and my understanding is that you are working on a consultative basis with um, with the town of Colchester. And thanks for being with us today. I'd love to hear about some of the things you're working on with Colchester. Sure. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I, before I sort of delve into the contents of the uh, memo that I sent, I just wanted to share th some thoughts that I didn't put in that um, sort of specific to the coordination that's been happening um, in Chittenden County. Um, I definitely want to assure the committee that the towns of Chittenden County have been working together, having lots of conversations. Um, I've probably participated in no less than 10 group discussions with other towns, um, with Northwest CUD, with other providers. Um, so I definitely want to assure you that we're trying to figure out the best path forward um, and on behalf of our residents. Uh, speaking for Colchester, you know, we haven't determined at this point that joining a CUD is really the best way to advance the expansion of Col um, broadband in Colchester. We've not closed the door on that idea, um, but just at this point not, has not seemed like, yeah, that's definitely the path forward that makes the most sense for us. Um, and I, you know, we wanna get into some of those sort of behind the scenes discussions about CUDs, I can do that. Um, 
but maybe I'll first jump into the memo content so we can go through that. And then if you had other questions about CUDs, I can get back to that. Um, so in Colchester, you know, in terms of the background, and I think Rob gave a really good sort of summary of what's going on in Colchester. Um, we have extensive coverage by consolidating Comcast, and that's resulted in sort of dispersed pockets of unserved uh, residents and addresses in the town. Um, and we don't get the sense that a single sort of large town-wide scale project would be the most efficient way to bring service to them. Um, we see it most likely as sort of one-offs here and there and trying to make the best use of the existing resources that are already on the ground. Um, you know, that's our perspective. Uh, we certainly can be convinced otherwise by other entities, but that's how we've seen it up to this point. Um, so that certainly um, is a challenge given the um, Act 71 and sort of funding framework that exists now. Um, you know, and three main challenges, the funding allocations, the universal service plan that we've talked quite a bit about, and then the grant eligibility. Um, in terms of the funding allocation, um, the current allocation based on the initial 116 million uh, on construction funds of that, um, I think Colchester was eligible for about 160,000. It seems like that may sort of get tripled uh, through the, the new um, legislation of funding that's been allocated. So we may be in the range of about 450,000 um, when it's all said and done. And that's, you know, maybe you know, generously 5% of the total cost um, that we've seen to do sort of a whole overbuild of the town. Um, so we know that there's a large funding gap there. Um, and that's just the uh, result of the fact that we do have a lot of roads that already have service on them. So the way the formula works is, you know, the, the piece of the pie that comes to Colchester is quite small compared to the realities of what the actual construction costs are going to be. Um, so I think that's the first sort of issue that we wanted to highlight. Um, in terms of the universal service plan, as Rob explained, mm -hmm. having to have a, a, a plan for the entire town that commits how each residence and each address is going to be served, given the patchwork that we have now, um, I think would be very difficult to obtain. Um, I had a lot of conversations with um, the folks in Bolton, and they, you know, had a great situation where um, I think Consolidated had a requirement to serve this small number of I think 13 houses and could get a letter. I don't see Colchester being able to get letters from various service providers committing to provide service. So we feel like the Universal Service Plan, as it stands now, is a pretty significant hurdle in being able to access the grant funds that are going to be allocated to the town. Um, and then lastly, the grant eligibility piece. Um, so currently towns are not eligible, nor are um, consolidated or um, Comcast. And so sort of the th three options that may make the most sense for us are not on the table currently. Um, and that's just, you know, we're looking maybe for a little bit more flexibility in terms of eligibility, uh, eligible recipients for grant funds in order to give us maybe the ability to work um, more flexibly with folks. Um, I included in my memo a little sort of trying to make a flow chart um, to summarize this. So the universal service plan requirement uh, makes partnering with eligible service providers a challenge because I don't think any one of them is going to be able to commit at this time to serve every unserved address in Colchester. Um, the small location of funding, I think, can make us sort of not attractive as a CUD member at this point. Um, we, I think we, and I don't want to put any words in anybody's mouth, but I think we actually may make the business case for some of the existing CUDs worse because we're going to bring all sorts of costs to the table, but not a lot of grant funding. Um, and then the fact that the town isn't eligible, nor is uh, um, Consolidated or Comcast sort of eliminates sort of what's left, uh, in my opinion. So the result is there's potentially a pot of money that's mainly allocated to Colchester, while it's smaller than what we think we need it could be left on the table and go unused as things stand now. Um, and it's just making it very difficult for us to, to find a partner that makes sense and to figure out the best path forward. Um, more on the solution side, and I suspect this is what most of the rest of the hearing will talk about. Um, on the funding allocation piece, you know, is there a way to rework the funding allocation to make it um, more based in the actual reality of the costs for each community. Um, and we understand the methodology and the, the idea behind it that there's unserved portions of road that have addresses on them and breaking it down that way. Um, just the reality of the build in Chittenden County communities is much higher than in a more wide open rural area. Um, and the universal service plan, similarly, could that be modified to 
somehow allow for a phased approach or in recognition that in certain areas, it's just not feasible to be able to have a plan that absolutely says how every residence and address is going to be served. We absolutely understand the, I think the motivation for the universal service plan and not wanting to see, you know, the one house way at the end of the road be left out. Um, but I, the reality is that it's in, impeding progress, I think. And so is there a way we can modify it that would be acceptable to, to, the, um, to the legislature and to VCBB? And then in terms of eligible applicants, um, I think it would be wonderful if there was the opportunity for municipalities to be a direct recipient. I'm not sure that Colchester would actually want to be the direct recipient, but having that option may give us the ability to say, you know, oh, putting $100,000 towards this line extension, if we could, you know, allocate those funds, um, that may be able to help a project move forward that couldn't get over the hurdle on its own. Um, and speaking with Clay about the line extension project in Colchester, I think at one point there was a, you know, a $10,000 funding gap. And maybe, you know, in similar situations elsewhere in the town, if there was a pot of money that could be used to just get over that hurdle, that may actually be able to, to get projects built that wouldn't have otherwise been able to. Um, and then allow communities with extensive um, consolidator Comcast build out to partner directly with those ISPs. Um, and again, I know, I think there's history with frustration about these pockets existing in their service territories currently, but the reality is they may be the most efficient source to get uh, service to the unserved pocket. So could we, um, in a, as a non-CUD town, partner with them directly and use some of those grant funds? Um, those are the ideas that have things that have come up with us thinking, oh, if we had that flexibility, it may actually help us move the needle a little bit. Um, Meredith, we've got a question in the room. Uh, sure. Representative Sebelia. Yes. Thanks, Meredith. Uh, so can you tell me, uh, is, uh, is the town having conversations with consolidating Comcast? How are those going? What's their response? What are they saying? So I've had a few um, direct conversations with Consolidated um, and they've been very helpful. Uh, you know, I think I, primarily the most recent discussions were trying to understand their schedule for bringing fiber to Colchester. Um, I think it's in the 2024 to 2025, maybe 2026 timeframe, assuming no changes to their schedule. So there is quite a few years before they're planning to do that bigger uh, project in Colchester. Um, I, don't think I've had any direct conversations at this point with Comcast. Um, so that has not, um, I know the LECAP um, project that Clay spoke about was with Comcast and they worked, I think, very favorably uh, through that project to get the service to those 35 customers. But my, I myself have not recently had any conversations with Comcast. Okay. And so, uh, you know, I heard the discussion about, you know, being cost prohibitive to overbuild the entire town certainly seems like that would be the case. Uh, you know, what is the sense of how, uh, I mean, is there a sense or are you kind of working through that of how to get to these, uh, these addresses? Yeah, that we're trying to come up with a scheme. I think if okay. there were um, some sense that we may be able to bring dollars to the table to work with Consolidated or CCI, then maybe we would have a more pointed conversation about that. But right now that's not an option for us. Um, and so the way the legislation is currently written, it's sort of pushing us to work with somebody else. Um, and that at this point hasn't, there are plenty of people who are willing to talk to us and brainstorm, but nobody has said, yeah, we can do it. Okay. And uh, have any of the uh, Chittenden County towns that you're working with discussed using any of the federal ARPA dollars for uh, broadband investments? Um, I've not had that specific conversation with any other towns. I know for Colchester, all of their ARPA funds have been earmarked for the sewer project that was just passed, uh, approved on town meeting day um, in Mallet's Bay. There's um, a long planned sewer project and all of the ARPA funds for the town have been voter approved to go to that project. Okay, and then uh, Mr. Chair, if I might, I have a question. So I just wanna double check something for our ledge council. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Question. So, so it seems to me, you know, that it seems like it makes the most sense to be trying to work with Consolidated and Comcast as the major providers there. Um, I think that's also what we're hearing. It seems to me that the only prevention to utilizing the funding that's available uh, in terms of working with Consolidated and Comcast is if you are a single town. 
So if you were multiple towns, you would be able to tap into the dollars and work uh, on a case by case basis. I think it, it, you know putting together a universal service plan with both of those providers, right? Uh, just to clarify, when you say working with multiple towns, you mean if they formed a CUD? Yes, if they formed a CUD they would be able to negotiate with Consolidated and Comcast, right? I mean, that's, we've only Perfect. banned. Yep, that's right. So in terms of eligible providers for construction grants, your CUD yeah. or your small communications provider, yeah. so not Comcast or Consolidated, right? or your any ISP right. that's partnering with the CUD. So that's the... It's that CUD requirement that I think is the so the uh, Com, um, Colchester could partner with a neighboring town, for instance. They could form a CUD by partnering with a neighboring town, have two rep, you know representatives from both towns. They could working with uh, the two providers there, Comcast and Consolidated, identify the underserved addresses. And you know, working with the two existing providers there, not even overbuilding them. You know, what's it going to take to get to the end with these existing providers? Tap into these dollars, and and I mean, is that something that would be possible? I think so. I think based on what you're saying, yeah. it meets this definition where yeah. it's the ISP and the CUD, yeah. however many towns decide to get together. I mean, to me, that seems like the easiest solution, right? I mean, working with the existing providers that are in the town. Uh, and tapping into dollars that you know we've allocated for this. I think there's that there's potential there for sure. Um, you know, I think the question of would those providers, given the dollars that are available, willing to say yes, absolutely, we're going to serve every you know. But I, I, I think that's a, a good place to start a discussion. Is that would they be willing, you know, if we formed a CUD to um, agree to that serve every single unserved address given the dollars that are currently available um what can they make that that work that business case work um i think that's worth com having a conversation with them about it certainly would be the cheapest way to do this uh it certainly would you know do the least uh, uh compete the least with the existing providers that are there would offset the you know uh uh remarkable amount of you know one-off little bills that they haven't gone to i mean it seems like a pretty big uh bonus for actually those two providers who chose not to build to the end of the road uh to work in that manner it seems like the easiest way to tap the dollars and, and get that done but the isps who are currently incumbent in um, colchester provide a level of service that would qualify um under um that's a very good question <laughs> i i don't think so currently. And that's the 100 by 100? 100, 100, right. Got a lot of copper, copper and a lot of copper and a lot of cable. Right. right. Okay. You know, I, and like I said, I have had conversations with um, Consolidated about their plans for fiber. That's several years out. Um, I don't know, you know, if there's dollars that can come to the table, can that be advanced to then allow 100, 100 um, to be offered throughout the town. Um, but you know, I certainly understand the concept. And like I've been saying, I think freeing up the way some manner to, to work with existing infrastructure makes sense. So it's it's worth thinking about. Thank you, Meredith. Um, appreciate you sharing this and also appreciate the document you shared with us um, online. Sorry, I yep, do have one more, well, sorry, ahead. one more question, Meredith. Is, has there been any engineering or kind of like high level cost cost estimates done for Colchester or any of the other towns, um, what we're looking at, or is there discussion about doing that? Yep, um, so I think Sean, I don't wanna put words in his mouth, I think he did a very high level cost estimate. Um, I believe um, some other private, smaller eligible providers have also done some level of cost analysis. Um, so we have some sense um, of the cost. I don't wanna share them because I haven't sort of been given the okay to do that, um, but it's, I think, safe to say that it's you know, many millions of dollars um, compared to the potential funding that we have available. So probably in line with what the other CUDs are looking at, like 60-40, or is it more, more than the 60-40? I think, well, significantly more. I think, like I said, I think the, the grant funds that 
are currently allocated are more like in the five to 10% range of cost cover recovery. It's a, a very small piece of the total cost. Just just to add on that, if Consolidated is already planning a build for all the cabled areas, the cost to reach the areas that they're not planning to build already, uh, that percentage could work. Yeah, yeah it, it, I'm happy to have that conversation with them if we think that we could potentially bring funds to the table. We expect any private provider, especially if they're going to own the infrastructure, to commit to quite the contribution. Thank you, Meredith. Um, I want to turn to Sean now. Sean, thanks for being with us today. And, and I know that, um, well, actually I don't know, but I understand that, that yeah, there's been some conversations kind of coming um, from north to south in terms of some of the work that you're doing in Northern Chittenden County. And I want to understand how that might um, kind of connect with some of the conversation we're having today. And actually also how it you know, would potentially um, serve as uh, a model for, you know, for other CUDs uh, around the state that border towns that, um, you know, maybe could, could, uh, could benefit from joining a CUD or partnering in some way. So thanks for being with us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, I do have a, a maybe somewhat redundant at this point after um, the folks went ahead of me, but I did kind of prepare some, some notes that might be helpful and then certainly, um, you know, uh, ask, ask away at questions. Um, uh, thank you for uh, having me, you know, uh, upon request from um, Rob uh, to come today and, and speak regarding the non-CUD communities and how they relate to the Northwest model. Um, you know, for those who are unaware, um, you know, from the beginning, Northwest heavily committed to trying to find a solution uh, that provided the best option for our communities with an open access multi-tenant network, um, prioritizing affordability and universal service to every premise uh, in our district that does not currently have a fiber connection. Um, we believe we've crafted that model. Uh, we believe we, we've crafted a successful model that leverages grant opportunities and revenue potential from retail ISPs to achieve that goal. Um, with the completion of our business plan now and financial model, we, we have a much deeper insight into the levers that drive those assumptions. Um, the two most important variables of that is a blend of our premise density across the entirety of the district and the availability of grant dollars or grant capital. Um, for our district, we're looking at somewhere around 35% of the homes and businesses are considered underserved. So it is fairly significant. Um, we reached a point now um, during our planning process where it's not really advantageous for us to continue to add premises that don't have adequate grant dollars or adequate grant capital to offset the potential debt incurred to the CUD. Um, doing so very likely would upend the financial model and put the entire project and the 21 communities that we represent at risk of not having um, a successful project. Um, hence why we are now uh, proceeding with great caution to uh, increasing our scope and really taking it kind of case by case. Um, with that said, um, you know, in terms of the non-CUD communities, um, you know, we I think just by the nature of the CUDs and, and who we are, we're really passionate about broadband equity for everyone. So, you know, we, we want to try to assist in ways that we can and um, find a, a creative solution if there's if there's one there. Um, we certainly don't want to um, leave our neighbors behind in any way. So, um, you know, if there's avenues where Northwest can assist um, or, or we come to, you know, some plan in the future that makes sense, um, we're all for it and we're here to help. Um, So I don't know if that pause was for questions because I have one, Sean. Yes. Yes, which, which is, um, and, and this might also be for Rob or Maria um, to chime in on this. But to what extent is a CUD precluded from um, supporting um, increased connectivity in a neighboring town um, where you know maybe you're running your fiber across the town border into a non-partner town? Um, that you can support, you know, I guess what we're calling for the purposes of this discussion, an orphan neighborhood, um, where are you pre precluded in some way from doing that in that, 
you know, crossing that border and going in to support that neighboring town who's not a partner somehow obligates you to provide universal service in that town or precludes you from um, accessing grants to, you know, I guess what I'll call a line extension into that neighboring town. What are the challenges in doing that? Um, whether it's accessing grant funding or, you know, coming up with a universal service plan, which maybe isn't practical for that neighboring town, but you are supporting um, connectivity in that neighborhood. What, what are some of the challenges there, if any? I don't, I don't believe there's limitations, um, you know, in terms of a universal service. I'm gonna have to rely on Rob to, um, he's going to be more in the know on, on the specifics of uh, the necessity for universal service plan if you were to go there. Um, my understanding is there's not necessarily a limitation um, to uh, build out into non-CUD communities, um, but uh, I'm sure Rob has much deeper insight into some of the more specifics there. Sure, sure. Uh, communication union districts, uh, by their, their original legislation that created them, are allowed to serve neighboring areas. Uh, the, there's two different challenges. One, in order to access the grant funding via Act 71, there needs to be a plan for the entire town. Uh, the second challenge is if the town was going to come use other funds and say contract for service like a town could do with a private provider, it's unclear whether they could do that with a CUD. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's some language that says that towns can contract with a private provider. I don't know if they're meaning that like not as their own municipality or as it can't be another provider that is a municipality. It's something that's unclear that we've been going around and around and haven't come to a solution. But that is that is one option. If a town can bring different resources to the table to help the CUD to be able to serve those neighboring areas and addresses, it makes sense to the way wire centers work and the way geography to topography at all. It makes sense. And it could help the CUD business case too. Do you have a question? I'm not sure I understood that. Okay. It was just said there, but. Did, did you want to chime in? Right. Yeah, uh, well, no, I was just actually looking at the language. And I think it's consistent with what you've heard, at least so in terms of the CUD's statutory authority to provide services to non-member um, towns. So uh, I'm just remembering it now, make sure I'm understanding it myself. So the CUD can provide communication services to its district members. Um, and to also provide communication services for such other residential and business locations as its facilities and obligations may allow, provided such other locations are in a municipality that is contiguous with the town limits of a district member, and further provided such other locations do not have access to internet service um, that meet the current speed requirements of the connectivity initiative, which I think now are 100, 100. So I think that is the authority of the CUDs to go beyond their borders. I think in terms of you know, the issue that, I was just looking at the issue that Rob just raised, the towns themselves, uh, so not CUDs, just talking about municipal authority, to own or operate communications plant. They were given that authority in 2007, I believe, um, and to finance those projects with revenue bonds. And then in 2019, the legislature allowed the towns to enter into public-private partnerships. I think that's what Rob's talking about, maybe, that, that new that ability to, come, to work with yeah. private providers. But I believe that's still also with revenue bonds. Yeah. And you had actually asked for a study about whether towns should be allowed to use general obligation bonds to finance communications plan to be got that report back. Clay can probably talk about it, but um, from the Department of Public Service, the Treasurer and Secretary of Administration, and pretty much it was a wait and see. There wasn't a uh, authority or a recommendation that they allowed to use their general taxing. 
misunderstanding what you said, please correct me. Oh, I, I might need some clarification clarification too. Um, I was under the impression if a town was contracting for service, i.e. not owning and operating the infrastructure, they could use whatever funds they want in order to do that. It was more of a prohibition of a town using general funds to own and operate the a communications plant is how I understood it. And what was that? Under, what statute was that? Just so I'm looking at the same thing you're looking at. Was that the... I'm going to have to pull it up myself. Clay, Clay may know it offhand, too. Uh, we developed a whole FAQ about this uh, before COVID. <laughs> uh, you're uh, taxing with pre-COVID memory. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm trying to find uh, it. Uh, I, I do think that revenue bonding has been uh, problematic for towns. Um, and I mean, certainly New Hampshire is has done a lot of it um, and has funded those projects through an assessment, a special assessment on the bill. So they've worked with Consolidated to do the build. Uh, and there's there's a, an assessment on the customer's bill uh, to pay for uh, those bonds. They're revenue bonds. Uh, and they're they're funded through the uh, that special assessment on the on the service. <laughs> What, what I'm seeing, it's 30 VSA, uh, 3056 is what I was looking at. And what we had previously looked at is that a town entering a contra contracting for service relationship would not be creating its own network and is therefore not subject to the restrictions in 30 VSA, 3056. Tax revenues, bond proceeds, commercial bank loans, and grants from the national government can be used when a public entity contracts with a private party to construct discrete portions of a project. Uh, for instance, funds dedicated to economic development could be used to support such an arrangement. Um, trying to see, I think 24 VSA 1913 had something to do with it as well. I'm so sorry. It's title, tw title 24, Chapter 54. Okay, yep. That's, so that's revenue bonds. But what, what were you reading from? I'm sorry, before that. You were, what were you reading from? I was reading from a, a frequently asked questions we developed. I went oh. over at the public service department. I'm trying to. Uh... It, it's 30 okay, yeah. from 30 uh, VSA 3056, which uh, deals with limitations on taxes and indebtedness for CUDs. It's in the, it's in the communications union district chapter. And that's pretty much saying just revenue bonds, right? That's the limitation on the CUDs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm look. I'm looking at uh, chapter chapter fifty. Well, I guess it's a uh, twenty four VSA nineteen thirteen section F. Is what I'm looking at. Uh, but uh, it's so a communications plan that is subject the subject of a public private partnership authorized by the subsection may be financed in whole or, or in part. So that's where it starts. So, so this but, is. Uh, but I, I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. I have to stop trying to pretend to be. So. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, maybe we can explore um, some of these parts of statute um, over the weekend or whatnot. Um, I would like to bring this back to, um, you know, kind of a higher level question of, um, and, and don't want to move too far away from some of the things that Sean um, was sharing with us. But um, again, the, the purpose of this discussion, uh, again, hopefully one level above brainstorming was, is there a way um, to support these discrete neighborhoods in towns that, generally speaking, um, have coverage um, from a Comcast or a consolidated or an incumbent, but also have areas that are wholly unserved by incumbent carriers? Um, and is there a way to um, expand um, either from the current incumbent network or bringing in uh, the cavalry in the form of CUDs um, to, you know, to rescue those orphan neighborhoods. Um, so, and Representative Sevilla. So just at a high level, um, I think one of the things that the VCVB has wrestled with is that, um, that authority that CUDs have, and then the limitation on the funding uh, at the VCVB. And so 
that's, I think that that is what Rob is pointing to. Yes. Yeah. So, right. Yeah, the uh, discussion about uh, CUDs building outside their territory um, led me to think, is there anything preventing uh, a, an eligible ILEC provider like WCBT from building outside of its territorial boundary, telephone territorial boundary? Uh, uh, Chair Briggle, I can try to address that question if you'd like. Please. Um, I would say yes and no. Um, there's technically nothing that, um, and I, I should say I have, I think, three points to make here. Uh, there's technically nothing in the law that would prevent um, a rural LEC from building outside of its, um, its territory. Um, I think generally it becomes more problematic for them in terms of um, the federal subsidies that they receive. So, you know, keep in mind that these areas that are served by, I mean, completely served by Waitsfield, Champlain Valley, the, their, their exchanges, Franklin's exchanges, any rural LEC, any independent phone company, and um, a majority of consolidated uh, telephone exchanges have always been subsidized by the FCC. These areas are, um, are, are they're, they're high cost exchanges and the, the, the federal government has determined that the cost of provisioning telephone service in these areas, the, the cost of operating a telephone network in these areas exceeds the, the, the revenue expectations for them. So they've always been subsidized through the Universal Service Fund. Um, actually, uh, um, d not sure that I uh, like the, the term orphaned neighborhoods because, um, you know, I think that they're not, they're not forgotten about, they're not abandoned. Um, you know, the carriers are trying to get out to these areas and, you know, Waitsfield, as an example, has built um, a, a great portion of their telephone network with the help of federal subsidies and with their own private uh, investment in these areas. So, you know, they're, they're working on these areas. It's not that they're um, uh, abandoned, like um, <clears throat> they've, they've been portrayed. So, um, you know, I, I think that Waitsfield, uh, as an example, could go into that consolidated telephone exchange, but, you know, they're, they wouldn't be getting the subsidy for that. The FCC is actually providing subsidy to another carrier for that area, which means you kind of have a clash of, of federal funding. Um, and, you know, that's an area where I think telephone companies have traditionally worked together um, in a way that the industry as a whole is not allowed to work together, I don't think. Um, but someone mentioned the awkwardness of carriers having to work together or could prevent one another from uh, from from uh, being a having a, a town have a, a universal service plan. Do keep in mind that the telecommunications market is a competitive one, and carriers aren't supposed to be working together. They're supposed to be fighting each other for uh, for market share. Um, we're supposed to be uh, realizing the benefits of competition. And so I think when you're asking, you know, two CLECs to, to get together and divide up a town, um, if nothing else, that raises antitrust issues and issues of competitiveness in, in these areas. So, I mean, that's just another area where, um, where there's an awkward tension, I think, um, coming up with a complete solution for a town. Oh. So that applies to uh, broadband fiber as well, or if they were all, if they were if they were building fiber into that yeah that, territory. That's that correct. Well. The high the high costs uh, the universe the the FCC's high cost programs the the uh, the art off is one of them. The uh, rate of return carriers um, uh, are subsidized under a different program. Th those programs are designed to expand broadband now. And that's been the case since the transformation order uh, in 2011, where they took high cost money, they were supporting telephone networks and they reverted it to, um, uh, to, to broadband. So we, we're uh, taxing telephone service 
and then we are supporting uh, broadband build out with those those revenues, and they have they have build out requirements to meet um, to to continue uh, receiving that funding. The only thing that that um, is a little dissonant for me, Clay, is the is the concept of competitiveness mm -hmm. um, with these areas being rural and being federally subsidized. I don't know if there's any state subsidy. Um, there's a reason they're being subsidized because you know w without that subsidy, without that um, protection, if you will, from a monopolistic standpoint, nobody's going to serve um, those areas, and. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's one of the challenges we're dealing with here is the, the lack of competition um, to, to kind of get to these, uh, in the case of the discussion this afternoon, those neighborhoods that, um, that currently don't have service. I, I, I totally get how we don't want uh, collusion in the market um, and um, we do want to support competitiveness. I just don't think we have it. Uh, right. I don't think we have that competitiveness. Right. Yeah, I, I would agree there's not, Competitive, competitive competition in fact um, in the unserved neighborhoods that we're talking about and the rural areas of our rural exchanges. Uh, you know, the 1996 Act had provided an environment where competitive LEX can come in and cherry pick, and that's what they do. And um, as much as we can fault them for that, they're completely allowed to do that and and you know they're they are encouraged to do that um under federal law so even even the independent telephone companies put up with competition in in their most lucrative areas you know in the village centers um in, in the downtown areas um just unlike the um uh the the CLEC, the the RLEX have an obligation to serve everyone, and they so they do. But um, you, you're losing uh, with competition. You're losing the uh, inherent subsidy that you have between the rural part of your community and the um, uh, the urban part or the the suburban part. As in, you know, people in um, uh, the the village of Waitsfield aren't uh, necessarily subsidizing um, the people at the end of the dirt road. If in fact Comcast or another cable company is in the village center uh, competing with the telephone company, and you have um, you know you have the problem of churn, and you have the problem of um, uh, of losing market share. Um, then your costs have increased in the rural area, which then slows down um, your your progress in deploying broadband. So um, as a concluding comment from one member of this committee, um, who also happens to be the chair, um, I, th this was helpful for me in, in terms of framing the problem. Um, and I, I think I understand it better than I did 90 minutes ago. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm less clear on the solution, and um, we have two members of this committee who are um, representatives of towns that have this challenge, and there's other um, members of the legislature. I mean, it's, it's a weekly occurrence Well, I will talk to somebody in the cafeteria who is a Chittenden County or nearby town that is, you know, being challenged by this um, and, you know, have the question of, in the last two years, we have allocated hundreds of millions of dollars to support, um, you know, broadband build out in the state. What about this neighborhood in fill in the blank, Williston, and you know, again, towns in Chittenden County? I, I don't have an answer for that. And um, again, I, I think I better understand the problem now. We're going to be in session for another six weeks. Um, I'll be standing by uh, if there is a legislative solution here. I'm all ears, um, but. I think there, we've identified some of the challenges of um, you know, some of those rifle shot approaches in, um, in you know, maybe being at odds with some of the work that we're trying to do more broadly around the state in supporting the universal coverage CUD work. So you know, as these solutions are developed, 
for some of these discrete areas. Um, I also want to think really uh, hard and deeply about how those fit together with what we're trying to do more broadly in rural parts of the state that have been challenged for, I guess, decades now. Um, so at any rate, um, I, I just as a concluding comment, um, welcome um, additional comment from folks who have testified today, as well as, um, you know, I'm, of course, members of this committee. Um, and um, thank you for your time on a Friday afternoon in, in uh, educating this member. And um, again, we're, we're all ears as you continue to kind of toggle on some of these challenges in some of these towns as to if there are, you know, legislative, um, you know, if there's tinkering that we can do that, you know, may support some of this work that you're trying to do. So thank you all for your time. Appreciate it.